Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the first Great Ape Survival Partnership Hangout. This is the first of a series of monthly webcasts generated from the United Nations headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. And we're very honored today in this inaugural webcast to be joined by Dr. Jane Goodall, who is a Great Ape Survival Partnership Ambassador, the world's foremost expert on chimpanzees, and the United Nations Messenger of Peace. This GRASP Hangout is the result of many weeks of planning. We have, we have taken questions from around the world from uh, supporters of GRASP and of the work that Dr. Goodall does in Africa and elsewhere. And for the next 30 minutes or so, we will ask these questions to Dr. Goodall and we will listen to her answers. Before we begin, though, I'd like to give Dr. Goodall the opportunity to open this discussion, as she does many others, with her unique greeting. My unique greeting. <laughs> Very important this time since behind us the chimpanzee my study subject is not represented. Yes, that is true. We, we have many apes behind us and for those who are not aware, over my left shoulder is Bonobo. In the center is an orangutan and hovering over Dr. Goodall is a gorilla. Exactly looming over He's looming me. over you. Yes, he is. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us today in Nairobi, Dr. Goodall. And I would like to begin the questions with just some general ones, frankly, that you have spent now over 50 years working in research and conservation of chimpanzees and great apes. And I'm curious what you would regard today as the greatest threats to the long-term survival of these incredible species. Well, you know, it depends really which country they're in. One of the major threats everywhere is deforestation and loss of habitat. And then, particularly in Africa, it's the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, including apes. And there is still killing of mothers to steal infants for selling in the live animal trade. Also, many of the chimpanzees and other apes get caught with wire snares around their wrist or foot. These are snares set by, by poachers for capturing antelopes, pigs, and so forth. There's also a risk of disease because these apes are so like us that they can catch uh, human diseases. And so as we push further and further into the forest, there is this risk of disease. It's well known that you spend over 300 days a year traveling and speaking and advocating for the protection of great apes and their habitat around the world. But that's not how you began. And it certainly is not what you probably intended in 1960 when you began your research. What changed and what brought you into this world of advocacy? What changed was when I realized during a conference in America when for the first time we brought all the different people studying chimpanzees together. It hadn't happened before. And it was to talk about the, the similarities and differences of chimpanzee behavior in different areas of their range and look for cultural differences in things like tool using, which we found. But we had one session on conservation and it was absolutely shocking to see what was going on in every single one of the study sites. We had another session on conditions in some captive situations, such as medical research, the cruel training for services, the horrible things that happened to pet chimpanzees. And it was absolutely shocking. So I went to that conference as one of the scientists planning to continue a very wonderful field, analyzing data, which I love doing, time for writing, scientific papers, and for the popular for the popular press. I had a son, I had time with him, there was a growing research station, and we couldn't have had a more idyllic life. But when I left that conference, I was an activist without an equal. I don't remember making any decision. It was just that now it's my turn to do something for that. And that was 1986. And since that time, I haven't been more than um, three weeks consecutively in any one place. You get this question all the time. How do you do it? Where do you find the energy to be that, that dedicated to a cause? 
I, I mean, I was obviously born with good, healthy genes. That's that's a big plus because I'm 81 and I, I could have succumbed to all kinds of disease. Um, the other thing is that I'm an obstinate sort of creature. And what's happening on the planet, not just to the apes, but to all wildlife, and, you know, what's, how we're damaging the future for our children as we destroy and pollute and change the climate and so forth. And it makes me angry. And I'm not going to give in. I'm going to use my life to fight, to change as much of this as I can. And I know I'm only one person, but fortunately, um, our youth program is now in 139 countries with about 150,000 groups of young people of all ages. And they are the army, if you like, out there carrying on with this fight and taking action writing letters and even lobbying. That's wonderful. You spoke at uh, an event last night in Nairobi at the National Museum, and you mentioned that when you first came to Africa in 1960 to study chimpanzees, it just happened to be chimpanzees that you were, you were given the opportunity to study. What was the greatest surprise that you found in, in your studies about chimpanzees? What was the greatest shock or the greatest sort of Surprises are the word I'd use in that studies. Well, there were, there were two, two different kinds of um, surprises, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, the first was seeing a chimpanzee using and making a tool, and that was breaking off grass stems, using them to fish for termites, and uh, then picking a leafy twig and stripping the leaves, or a wide blade of grass and, and trimming it down, something like that, which is modifying a natural object in there for the beginning tool making and at that time it was thought that we humans were the only creatures using and making tools so this was this was what brought the national geographic into the picture and as i started with only money for six months this was very exciting they were now going to um, continue funding and that enabled me to stay there and build up this research station it was in about the I think the fourth year of the study, something like that, that I first realized chimpanzees like us have a dark side to their nature. I thought they were like us, but nicer. And to find that when males patrol the boundaries of their territory uh, and they see strangers from a neighboring community, they will attack. And very often the victim will die of wounds received. And there was a four year period when the males of a larger community systematically attacked and left to die all of the individuals in the smaller neighboring community, except adults didn't get given birth. Those ones, they tried to recruit into their community to increase the gene pool. And does, do discoveries like that, uh, does that damage the possibilities for future research? Or did that actually propel it further and add momentum? Very unfortunate to say, but this discovery of the dark side chimpanzees made them seem even more like us than I had before. And it roused an enormous amount of interest. And the big controversy, you know, is this is this aggressive behavior innate or is it just in we humans? Louis Leakey, who was my mentor, who proposed the study in the first place, believed in an ape-like human-like creature about six, seven million years ago. And as he was searching for the fossilized remains of early man, he felt if, if, if we can send Jane out there to look at chimp behavior, and if she finds behavior in wild chimpanzees on one hand and humans on the other that are the same or similar, maybe that was brought with us from this common ancestor. And that, he said, enables me, or would enable him, to have a bit of feeling for how early man might have been, whose fossils he was given up. The fact that you brought up the similarities to humans is a very good segue for a, a specific question about a situation that's occurring right now in West Africa. We've discussed this earlier between ourselves, but as you know, the New York Blood Center for many years conducted research on chimpanzees, captive chimpanzees at the, so the Vilab facility in Monrovia. And uh, after closing the facility on March 5th of this year, they ceased funding to provide long-term care for the chimpanzees, which 66 of which have been left on an island in the river just outside of Monrovia. 
that has caused a great deal of contra uh, controversy. It has certainly enraged activists, uh, as it should. It has uh, put the New York Blood Center in a very poor light, I would think. I'm curious to get your sense on the value, potential value or otherwise, of chimpanzees in research and this particular case in Liberia. Let me start with the, with the Liberia situation because I was aware of this right from the beginning. It's Dr. Fred Prince, mm -hmm. who, who actually had, as a, as a research scientist like that, and to medical research, he really had an ethical commitment to the chimps. And it was he who got them onto this island out of their cages. And there was a commitment made when the, you know, at the time that the buyout, the New York Drug Center, would look after the chimps in perpetuity for the rest of their lives. So that part I was familiar with. And then a the, the terrible time during the Liberian Civil War and the chimps had to come off the island, many were eaten, and then they were put back on the island. And this last blow, when the center said no more funding, just like that. And to me, that's a moral offense because they had made a prior commitment and they had used these chimpanzees uh, with the hope of benefiting from their health. In fact, it turns out that the medical research on chimpanzees, although people thought it was going to be tremendously helpful, actually wasn't very helpful. And the National Institutes of Health recently put a committee together, a medical committee, and they went around every single NIH-funded research protocol and found that not one was benefiting human health. And so this is why they decided to close down uh, almost all the NIH chip facilities, just keeping a few because there were scientists who said, well, we might need more attention. And, you know, I, I, I was, knew quite well Bob Gallow was after the HIV AIDS research. And at one time, in fact, this is why all the chimpanzee centers became filled with chimps and there was a flurry of catching them from the wild before it was too late for HIV research. And it was soon after that that at a big AIDS conference, Bob Gallo, who had instigated the research on chimps, announced that our research is now boxed in by inappropriate results on chimpanzees. And they were no longer useful for HIV. So that must show an awfully dark side of human beings if we're willing to use a species so close to us. You spoke before about the dark side of chimpanzees. This must be the, the flip side of that for us. I think so. And you know, it, it's shown too that chimps can show love, compassion, and altruism, just like us. We both have the two, the dark and the, and the more noble side. And I think, you know, right from the beginning, when I first began to the medical research this 86 conference, and went and saw with my own eyes, because you can't talk about something if you don't see it. And when you see your closest living relative in a five foot by five foot barren cage, maybe 30 years, just because their bodies are so like us, and yet there was a refusal among most of the scientists to admit the equally striking similarities in intellect, um, personality, and particularly in emotion, the able the ability to feel mental as well as physical depression. That must be very overwhelming. It's, uh, as we said, we've taken questions from around the world prior to going on the air with this webcast, and I wanted to go to one of the questions now, which does address some of the, the traits of, of apes. John Z. Vagnon from the U.S., his question is, I'm fascinated by great ape language, including the controversial whispering bonobos from my left shoulder. Uh, he wants to know what your own experiences are in terms of ape language, uh, and do you have any opinion on some of the abilities and communication capacity of bonobos, such as Kanzi, who I believe you've met, uh, one of the captive bonobos that's based in the United States? Well, my feeling always has been that the biggest difference between us and chimpanzees, am I looking at you or am I looking Camera. at the questioner? The yes. questioner. Um, the, the fact that we have, our intellect has developed explosively. So chimpanzees are way more intelligent than we used to think, way more, as are many other animals. But, you know, we've, we've built an aeroplane that's just 
people all around the world without a drop of fuel just on solar power. This is amazing. That's what we're capable of. And I feel that this is because we, and as far as we know, only we have developed the kind of language that enables us to talk about things that are present, that enables us to make plans for the distant future, distant future, that enables us to have discussions so that we can bring people from different walks of life together to try and solve some kind of problem. And so when we come to the apes, I know the research on chimpanzees more than I know about the Lobos. Yes, I met Kamsi, and Kamsi had learned sign language, and it, it was thought that he was almost using human speech, because where we would say uh, banana, he would say banana. Um, he would say ah ah ah. Um, but Kanzi did amazing things with a computer. The two chimpanzees I know best are in Japan. It's I and her son Ayumu. And I can do the most amazingly complicated uh, tasks using a computer. And her son, Ayumu, was never taught anything. Just watched his mother doing her tasks. And he's now better than she is. And his, his visual memory is such that people have gone from all over the world to try and beat him. So if you have two screens with numbers here, random, every time you put the thing on, the numbers are random, zero to nine. And over here, it's blank, just blank squares. Before. I have looked at this and even got not one two where they are. He's already starting. The moment you start here, that disappears. So nobody knows how he does it. Um, so you know, the, the, the chimp definitely has cognitive abilities that are extraordinary. They haven't developed this ability to to communicate in the way that we do, as far as we know. And that, uh, that communication ability is something you've spoken about a great deal, not just in great apes, but parrots and other, other species. Are we not listening, or are they not speaking our language? Well, uh, I think, you know, one of my heroes was Dr. Doolittle. And Dr. Doolittle was taught all animal language by his parrot Polynesia. Oh, I so badly wanted a parrot. <laughs> and I used to pretend I could understand all what the dogs and birds were saying and translate to my friends. I, I think we're beginning to listen. I think we're beginning to I mean the songs of the whales, the way that, uh, you know, the communication of birds and things. We're beginning to make sense of them. But there's nothing that really resembles the way that we can use language in the way I described. That brings up a similar issue. Use of great apes in entertainment for almost a century, if not more, frankly. Great apes, and particularly chimpanzees and orangutans, have been featured in films and television and advertisements and so forth. It's dying out to some degree as a method of, of entertainment based on public perception, I think, and also computer generated images, but it's still happening a great deal. In China, for instance, there's an extremely popular television program called Wonderful Friends that uses chimpanzees and orangutans, which will now actually launch a feature film coming up shortly. I'd just like to the use of apes in entertainment and what we find i think is a number of people don't seem to understand why using a chimpanzee in a film or in a television show is a bad thing well i think you know there's two ways of answering that one is that it, it makes it sort of ridicules the ape because it's making them look like humans who aren't quite all there and, and they're very smart and they can do all these things and if you look at it in one way it's amazing what they can the way most people look is, oh, they're acting just like us, but they're kind of goofy or they don't quite get it right. And, you know, that's insulting to me. But the other thing is that these chimpanzees and, and the orangutans, they're taken from their mothers. The training is harsh and cruel almost always. On the set, it's always argued on the set, you have somebody from the Humane Society making sure they're not badly treated. And it's off the set, pre-trained is absolutely brutal and they will typically hide an iron bar in a newspaper a rolled newspaper so on the set all they need is that rolled newspaper no harm in that is that but in the, in the actor's mind 
is, is sure. as, as I understand too, usually you're dealing with infants in, in entertainment. It's very hard to work with an adult ape like the ones behind us. So once they've cycled out of being a performer, as it were, what's left for their life? Yeah, well, what's left for their life is that very often they go to poor roadside zoos. Um, a lot of, in a lot of cases, they are taken out and brought back in. But when they come back in, it's a young ape, but the papers are the same. So it's a cheater. That's in and out of the U.S. and places like Mexico. And the future for them is really grim because it's very hard for one of these chimpanzees to be integrated into a normal group. And although they do in an amazing way learn to form some kind of some kind of uh, you know, social unit, many of them are scarred for life and behave in very, very strange ways. The producers of that television program in China, Hunan TV, insist that their program is uh, a, a conservation educational tool. In the, in the program, the apes are taken to shopping malls, they're giving manicures and pedicures, they wear clothing. Could that possibly be a conservation learning tool? Yeah, it couldn't. And one of the tragedies is that whether it's China or anywhere else, when people see chimpanzees or orangutans or anything dressed up like this, they're so cute. I mean, behind us, we also have babies. You can see them. There's a baby over your head and a, a baby over that shoulder. And they are cute. And you put them in the clothes and people think, oh, I'd love to have one. So it, it increases the demand for pets. And even in the US, if I'm not mistaken, you can still buy a chimpanzee you can. as a pet, which is shocking in the United States. Don't point fingers at China. And they use an entertainment in the US as well. Certainly. Certainly. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't happening in China and coming over from a bit of the Western world, it's now happening now. So our work, you know, we have our youth program in China and we're working very hard to help young people understand this is a little idea any more than buying ivory ones. Thank you. We have another question that came prior to this uh, webcast from Rime Kenza Asselman. And uh, Rime wants to know, do chimpan chimpanzees really attack you when you show your teeth? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, maybe one chimp, captive chimp or something did, but in the wild, well, first of all, we wouldn't show our teeth. Um, mostly when the chimpanzees show their teeth, they're laughing. And what's interesting because of the structure of the face, uh, when we smile, our top teeth show, smile at me, you see? Uh, when a chimpanzee smiles, the lips show at the bottom teeth. Yeah. So the smile is different. <laughs> okay, so we can smile at chimpanzees, no problem. Okay. Um, another question is Peter McKenna from Uganda wants to know, why did you decide to focus your research on chimpanzees and not other apes? And we referenced before that there was a bit of serendipity to that. And how did that, how did that I, occur? I, when I went to Africa, I wasn't even, I didn't have my mind set on apes at all, not even monkeys. That was exotic. You know, you have to remember that back then, when I first came to Africa, 1956, um, nobody was studying apes or anything like that. And I would have been content to study anything that anybody had suggested, as long as I could be out in the wild. And it was Dr. Leakey picture. I think it's really lucky for me. That's wonderful. I'd like now to turn the questioning over to a, uh, a remote questioner. This is Maureen Waititu. She is a law student at Kenyatta University here in Nairobi. And she has a question prepared for Dr. Goodall. Maureen? Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dan Godal, <laughs> thank you so much for making the world a better place with your work and being such a wonderful inspiration to so many people. It's an honor to be with you in this forum. My question is, poaching and wildlife trade has been a major issue for conservation in the contemporary world. There are many different strategies and practices that have been put in place, such as intensive monitoring and patrolling, intelligence network mobilization, community-based anti-poaching, etc. I could go on and on. However, we have a long way to go in curbing this menace, as the government has done all it can. I made great progress to get hold of uh, the small-time poachers, 
there's still no much success in capturing the big fish. Uh, Dr. Den, what do you think has been left out to be done? What do you think can be done in furtherance to what has already been done to bring this problem to an end one and once and for all? Thank you. Well, there's an awful lot of different issues that you're touching on here. And I have to deal really with what I know about. And what I know about uh, is in relation to chimpanzees, particularly the chimpanzees in Tanzania, Uganda, to find that one of the big problems is the encroachment of humans into their forests as human communities grow. Now, there is some poaching by people living in poverty. But there's even more clearing of forest to grow crops by people living in poverty or to make charcoal or something like that. And it was when I flew over the Gombe National Park uh, back in the late 80s and I looked down on a little island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills that had been absolutely covered with forest. And that's when I realized that the people were struggling to survive, the land was over farmed and infertile. And that unless we help the people to improve their lives, there would be no way we could even try to save the chimpanzees. So our program, uh, Take Care of Takari to Alleviate Poverty, now works in 52 villages, villages that become our partners. There are volunteer forest monitors from every one of these 52 villages, and they use uh, tablets uh, donated by Google Earth so they register every negative human impact in their forests and that goes up to a platform that's called Global Forest Watch available to everyone. They're very proud of the work. So one answer to your question is involving all the local people and making them partners and finding alternatives uh, in their lifestyle. So if they're relying on money from uh, cutting down firewood, we we help them to do something else. If they're relying on poaching, as many do for a livelihood, then it's desperate that we find other ways for them to make money other than poaching, and again, make them our partners. But when you come on to the big syndicates and, and crime, I'm not really the person to ask about that. I do know that in many countries, the range of force is underpaid, under-equipped, and they're going to some of them will feel a huge temptation if they're offered a lot of money by a gang of coaches to show where, for example, the elephants are. So, uh, and then there's the problem of corruption that you touched upon, which is why the big shots aren't brought to justice very often. People know who they are, but when large sums of money are available, sometimes, unfortunately, those big shots are left free. Thank you. To follow up on that as well, we at GRASP have been tracking the illegal trade in great apes now for several years, and we published a report in 2013 called Stolen Apes that first began to give us some numbers. At minimum, we're talking about 3,000 apes every year lost from the wild. We know now that in this current year, the, the rate of seizures of great apes being trafficked live, almost exclusively live, is double from a year ago. So either we're getting better at capturing the bad guys or there are more of them out there. China. Going to China, going, most are going just to Asia, out of Africa, but also out of Asia, Southeast Asia, into mainland Asia as well. Uh, it is a huge problem. And again, it almost ties back to the entertainment question. Why would somebody want a live great ape? What is the attraction of owning a live chimpanzee or a live orangutan? Well, people just think they're cute to have. Um, chimpanzees, other animals in entertainment, it works. People go and watch. So there's so much education to do here. If people didn't watch these these television shows, if they didn't watch the movies, then there wouldn't be the demand for the apes to perform in them. So we have to attack all these things come from, you know, multiple sides. It's not a simple solution to anything. True. And just to make sure we have this on record, a chimpanzee does or does not make a good pet? A chimpanzee is sweet and cute when they're little, there's no question. But they don't stay sweet and cute. 
by the time they're five or six, they're already as strong as a person. By the time they're seven or eight, they're stronger. And the stories of what happens to these pets, uh, they're not pets, they're wild animals, and horrific tales of people being horribly mauled. Because chimpanzees can, can become very violent very suddenly. They decline into tempers, like temper tantrums. And especially when they're in a situation where they don't want to be. When they grow up, get older, they don't want to be a human child in a human house in human clothes. So if they make extremely bad pets, and again, they can't be re-socialized very easily. I've got another question that was submitted prior to this webcast. Um, Ann and Jerry from Kenya uh, asked, can you tell us what has changed most dramatically in the world in the 55 years since you started your research? Well, I would say the number of us living on the planet is probably the biggest change. Um, but yeah, there's so much else. We could go into deforestation, into pollution. There's just so, so much that changed. I mean, when I began, there was an equatorial forest belt and it kind of came you know, in the, in the western part of, of Tanzania, and it curled around through Burundi, Uganda, into the Congo Basin, and basically went down to through Central Africa to West Africa. And not totally unbroken, but huge areas were unbroken. Now, increasingly small fragments of forest, and you know that's a huge change too. But going back, the numbers of people, the the, the spread of consumer society, the fast food outlets, the trying to make everything cheap and not bringing in, when you cut the cost of an object that you buy, the, 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 the true cost, the environmental cost, and the damage to future generations. And you increasingly speak to those issues now, even though you may be the world's foremost, foremost expert on chimpanzees, issues such as climate change and food security and air quality are in your purview now. They, they are because once you start caring about the future, once you realize what we're doing to the planet, uh, you begin to find more and more things that, that it, it's, it's all interrelated. You can't take just one piece. You can study one piece, but if you're actually talking about it, you need to interrelate it to all the other issues that are damaging the planet. And you know, an, an aspect which people don't talk about when we're talking about is yes, we know that CO2 is released when you cut down a rainforest. And the more rainforest we cut down, the less the trees can absorb CO2. Uh, most people know that you get dead areas in the ocean which are incapable of absorbing CO2. Much of that because the ocean's absorbed so much, it can't absorb anymore. Um, you know, these things leading to climate change. But it's also the increasing consumption of meat around the world as communities, countries get more wealthy. And this is not only destroying huge areas of forest to grow the grain, to feed the livestock, or actually um, turning the cattle out into the woodlands, which increasingly become deserts due to overgrazing. But it's also the fact that uh, these animals produce gas during their digestion, we do too, and this gas is methane, and that's a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. And, you know, so if, if, okay, so you don't care about the environment, you don't care about the horrendous cruelty to the animals in these intensive farms, never mind, do you care about your health? And because the animals are kept in these awful conditions, they have to be fed antibiotics routinely, not because they're sick, but to keep them semi-healthy. And these antibiotics getting out into the environment mean that the bacteria are becoming more and more resistant. This is acknowledged by all of the big organizations around the world. And so people are dying from a cut on the finger. And over, it's like maybe as much as 50% of all antibiotics certainly in the UK are given to livestock. And when you, I heard an interview the other day, and, and this man was told, well, you know, you feed your, your cattle this, these antibiotics, and 
it's it's leading to resistance. People are dying. And the guy said, yes, I know I can't help it. I have to use them to keep them alive, to feed people. You know, a, a good example of that as well is, is a commodity like palm oil, which is in half of every single uh, item on a supermarket shelf. And if you go to Southeast Asia, and I'm sure you have, and you fly over, you, you see acres and miles and hectares of nothing but plantations unsustainably developed. But how do you tell? And, and, and it's worth pointing out that this development, these, this, this industry, really is a tremendous piece of the economy of countries such as Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand and others. And moving into Africa and, certainly moving and Latin America. Certainly. But how do you tell those countries that they don't have a right same economy and the same luxury items that we do? Well, it's the same thing. We have to find alternative ways for them to make money because what they are doing is destroying their own country for the future of their children. It's the same thing. Make money now, never mind the future. Make money now, destroy the environment. It doesn't matter, we'll be dead. And, and so it's all about this selfishness. And sometimes there's an excuse of poverty, no question. Sometimes there is no such excuse of poverty. It's keep more and more and more money and accumulating it. They can't take it with them when they die. And many of them don't even want to leave it to their children. All of this comes at the expense of the habitat great apes live in and, and often the species directly. Extinction is a word we throw around very casually sometimes in conservation. And there are some great ape populations and species that are closer to extinction than others. Do you believe extinction is something that will happen in your lifetime or the lifetime of those watching at home? Not in my lifetime. I mean, you know, I'm 81. So it can't possibly you seem timeless. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> but, um, you know, local extinctions, yes. The, the apes will disappear in certain locations. Uh, I, I have faith that we shall, with our youth movement, and more and more people becoming more and more aware, along with the fact that the destruction of the forest is leading to climate change, all that that entails, and I think when we put all this together, the more value we can put on keeping the forests growing, the better. So even though red and red plus aren't the answer for the, for the long term future, if you can take money from the polluting companies and give it to the to the peasants to keep their forests growing, it's at least a temporary solution. And so I I feel that we do have this in the right? We are using it well in more and more instances. We will find a way because they mustn't become extinct. Not in my lifetime, not in your lifetime, not in my son or my grandchildren's lifetime. Because we wouldn't let it happen, right? I agree with you 100%. Right. And that's a great place. There's to, a good grasp. Let's thank you We're very much for that. <laughs> well, there's a good. That's a good point to wrap up this this uh, grasp hangout with one grass last. And grass and that, okay. Uh, one last question that is a good is a good exit question from uh, Grace Ibunda in Kenya, and she says, "When do you plan to retire? And when you retire, who's going to fill your shoes?" Well, first of all, I shall go on doing what I'm doing as long as I can. I have no retirement plans. Uh, my body will give out at some point, or I may drop down dead. You know, we don't know, do we? What's going to happen? And who's going to step into my shoes? We have young leaders around the world, growing number of young people who get it. I don't know that anybody will step into my shoes. I've spent 80 years developing all these different ways, but I'm totally confident that there are those out there who can fill the shoes in the, along the different paths that those shoes have moved. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Goodall, for joining us today on this inaugural GRASP Hangout. We will come back again next month and the months after that with a regular series of grass hangout conversations with experts uh, from the field. For those of you who watched at home, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thank you. Bye.